Let me start out by saying what a gift you all are to me. I appreciate you so much and uh, just grateful to be with you. It's a great day. It's a great uh, way to start our week together before we rush into everything else, before we face challenges or opportunities, before we succeed or fail. Uh, we gather in gratitude for God's goodness and consider what it means to be caught up in that and uh, in a way that uh, makes life m- m- less challenging, uh, where we can meet the challenges of life with, with the ease of one another and God's goodness at work in us. As we consider what it means to live the life that is really life, or in th- this series we're calling A Generous Life, and um, sort of acknowledge at the beginning that sometimes the word generosity well, immediately sort of brings up some um, issues with us, or uh, maybe a little bit of like hold back. What are we talking about? Sometimes that's code for something. And so today, I hope we can kind of, kind of uh, work on that a little bit and kind of say what we really mean by living a generous life. Uh, but it's sort of like, are, are we talking about money? It's sort of that awkward dance that we we can sometimes do. It made me think of a dynamic that we probably all have experienced when you get a card for your birthday or for Christmas. Uh, and it's from your grandma, or your grandpa, or your auntie, your uncle, or someone, and you open it up, and um, there are two things in the card. A, a heartfelt, handwritten note specifically to you, and a check, right? So you got, you're opening it up, and what's the first thing you notice? The money, right? But it's not okay to talk about it yet, right? Like, you're sort of like, so you're, re- so like the whole time you're kind of holding it and you're reading the card and you're going through and eventually auntie or uncle or grandma or grandpa says, uh, and also there's a little something in there for you. And at that point you're like, oh yeah, I didn't, re- I didn't even notice this thing that I'm holding in my hand and been trying to figure out the six ways I might spend that 50 bucks. But I, yeah, it's so socially acceptable now to mention that there's, uh, there's money involved. And that's sometimes the dance that we do. Is money okay to talk about? Is it spiritual? Is it being talked about so we can manipulate each other? Like there's a, we've got a lot of baggage and we have baggage in our own personal life. And, and so is money part of the spiritual life? Yes. Uh, is generosity part of the spiritual life? Yeah, life? Yes. But how, how do we how do we really mean that? What is it, what's really going on? And, and today, I hope we can do that dance a little bit and talk about something that's really important as we talk about a generous life. The m- most generous person that I can think of, one of, the, one of the most generous people on the planet who ever existed was my mamma. Now, to be fair, I'm a little biased. She was a little biased. Uh, she said that we were all her favorite, but when we, it was just the two of us, she would clarify that I was actually her favorite of all the grandkids that in fact I was one of the best things that had ever happened to her. And she was extremely generous. Like you could just see in her eye that I could could ask for anything and she would would want to give it to me. Now, let me say a few things about Mamaw uh, that kind of help us understand generosity. One uh, aspect of Mamaw is that she worked harder than anybody you would ever, ever meet as well. So like generosity and hard work are sometimes kind of almost pitted against each other. And and in her, they came together. She worked hard. We were kind of working class, uh, working poor uh, class. And so um, if you didn't work, that was really bad. If you were lazy, that was really, really bad. And Mama didn't, uh, if she sat down, she would fall asleep, but she never sat down because she was always doing something. And she made us do that too. She worked us hard. When we were, she was babysitting us, we had jobs. We worked in the yard, we worked in the garden, we worked on the house, we worked on the car. We were always doing something, breaking green beans, picking up apples and making homemade apple sauce and making her famous peanut butter cookies, which I can share the recipe with you and it will still change your life. Mama worked hard and uh, some of my best memories are the generosity of that time. and and getting things done. The other caveat I've already alluded to is that Mamaw spent most of her life relatively poor. Now, uh, we didn't really lack for a lot, but everything, single thing they had, Mamaw and Papaw had, they worked for, and they kept very good care of it. And uh, and so uh, her relationship to stuff, their relationship to stuff was kind of this balance of not having a lot, but actually offering up more than would be expected. She opened up her house to family and neighbors and was sort of like one community. You kind of all knew each other. And as she got older, uh, she opened her, up her house to all the stray kids in the neighborhood and they would just kind of flock there and she would have them break beans and make applesauce and do peanut butter cookie. And they showed up for it voluntarily. 
And Mama would literally give you the shirt off her back. She'd give up the very last of whatever thing that she had. She had a generosity of spirit. And so this helps us clear up from the beginning what we're talking about when we use the word generosity. That it is first and foremost not really about money at all. It's mostly about something going on inside of us that, as an adjective, generous actually is much better suited to apply to the giver rather than the gift. You know what I mean? Like, what we mean by generous is something that is a a personality trait or a a skill or an ability that we gain to engage life in a certain way. Long before generosity is a matter of money, it's first a matter of the heart. Which means sometimes... To clarify our use of the word, sometimes things that we call generous aren't actually generous at all. Like what we mean is code for it was a lot. They gave a lot. But that giving comes from a place of maybe um, not, not maybe the best heart, a bad attitude or ulterior motive or, um, or, or some other reason. So even though someone gave a lot, it's not technically a generous gift, something to be called generous. And they... More specifically, they weren't becoming more generous through their giving. And the flip side is also true. You can give a little, but it still counts as being generous. And it's not really about the amount, but it's about what goes on in the heart. I think about when uh, Jenny and I were adopting our daughter, Sarah Grace, and she was in Guatemala for months before she came home. So we knew about her, we had pictures of her, and we felt connected to her, and we were doing some fundraisers to, to help bring her home. And um, my grandpa on the other side called us over, and he was a Depression-era uh, guy, 20 years older than my other set of grandparents, and um, tight. I don't know how else to say it. Like, re- like really frugal, right? Pinched every penny. So we were uh, doing the adoption fundraisers. He called us, and he handed me one of those envelopes, which, which had a check in it. And I'll never forget, because right around that same time, we had gone out to the mailbox a few days before or whatever, and uh, there had been an envelope and a check in there from a foundation that had heard about us uh, adopting, and we didn't know that, like, we didn't have a connection to them, and we didn't know the thing existed, and the check was for $1,000. And I remember thinking, I probably ran back across the road without checking for traffic as I ran back to Jenny, and like, look, look at this, we were so excited. And then we go to my, my grandpa, and as he hands me the envelope for our adoption, he, he's all misty-eyed. And I could just see all over his face what a big deal it was for him to hand us this thing. And, and as I opened it up and I looked in, there was a check in there for $50. And, 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 he's, and he, was, he was crying. And so, technically speaking, which of those gifts, the $1,000 or the $50, was more generous? I'll tell you, I, I can still go back to that moment with my grandpa with that $50 check that meant so much to him, given out of a place of, from his heart where it absolutely mattered. And I, I think about that to this day. We can give small amounts and still be generous. And we can give large amounts and technically not be generous. And Jesus talked about that very dynamic in two stories in Mark's gospel, in Mark 12, that describe those dynamics. Once Jesus said while he was teaching, watch out for the teachers of the law. So these would be the religious sort of higher-ups, the religious elite. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. Also, they devour widows' houses, which we'll talk about what that means in a second. And for show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Well, those are strong words from Jesus, aren't they? And what's going on there? Uh, the very people that should be entrusted with watching over the spiritual lives of other people, the people who are entrusted with the, the scriptures and people uh, entrusted with the religious life of a people are doing all of that for, for the wrong reasons. Like it's totally possible to do things for God to call things spiritual, to call things generous, and they not be about that at all. And it's a, it's a caution for all of us. It's, a, it's possible to do sort of the right things, but the motivation matters. To do it for the wrong reason is dangerous. And so we need to be aware of, it, of that. Their motivation matters, and it reveals actually something. It reveals the true condition of their hearts, that their giving is done from a place that's more about their own thing or self-advancement or prestige, or 
somehow uh, making a show. It's, it's um, not so much about faithfulness, about, but about flashiness. And, you know, it's totally possible to do church this way. It's totally possible to do our spiritual lives this way. Caught up in what other people see, doing the image management thing, and doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Jesus said, and they devour widows' houses, which is a very strong statement, and it's kind of like hard to know exactly what that means. A couple options. One thought is that maybe these uh, religious leaders had been asked to be the trustees of property, of managing someone's property, especially a widow who wouldn't have had an, a man in her life to do that. you, you got to find somebody. And so maybe uh, they, that was, and, and that we think that, that maybe, in fact, they did this kind of thing. I actually had somebody in our church years ago, uh, an older lady, come to me and ask me to be the trustee of her estate. And I immediately but kindly said, no, I can't do that. Because there need to be some boundaries, right? And that cross is an important one. And, and so maybe not only did these uh, religious leaders manage somebody else's property, but they mismanaged it and did so in a way that took advantage of, of someone else, perhaps. Another option is that the whole religious system was built on a, a little bit of an inequity, that in a sense, poor people were giving a lot, and then the religious leaders were using that and sort of living lavishly. On, on the backs of the poor, on the backs of the widows, people who were giving faithfully so that the religious leaders could put on a show and make it about how important they are. And that also is dangerous, and maybe even more so, because it's not quite so overt that somehow they had built the whole system on making it about them and making themselves look and feel important, not, not being faithful, but being flashy. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's a problem. That's why we actually need to talk about money, because it ties really to our spiritual lives in ways that we might not expect. In other words, money's not necessarily bad, or money doesn't make us greedy, but it sure can reveal when there's greediness in our hearts. It can reveal when we don't trust or when we're, we're caught up in a scarcity mindset. And what is really going on behind the scenes is driving so much of what we do. And so... Jesus wants us to be aware of that and to kind of be careful as we do anything, not just give money, but just as we do anything, to not make it about that, not make it about me or about my advancement or putting on a show. That's why the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that we should do our giving in secret, not just secret from other people, but almost in a way secret from ourselves. Remember what he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, which is a powerful metaphor, meaning like don't get caught up in your own awesomeness. But give in a way that it doesn't feed into something unhealthy already going on in you. Because giving can be that. It can become this whole other thing done for this whole other reason than caughting up, getting caught up in the cycle of generosity. A way to appease other feelings or to overcompensate for something. To appear better than we actually are. True generosity doesn't elevate us, but it humbles us. It doesn't raise our status. It, and in fact, it doesn't let us off the hook then to kind of do whatever we want. So part of, part of giving is the constant reminder that everything that we have is God's. And so if we think about whatever amount that we give is sort of, okay, we're going to give that to God, and then it gives the rest of it uh, to us so that we, I can do whatever I want to. That's the exact opposite of the, the process of generosity, a path of generosity which does something else. We take whatever we are going to give as the way to discipline ourselves and remind ourselves that it's actually all God's and that every single penny is to be used for him, every single moment, our whole lives. And for most of us, this is a process. This is why we need to talk about generosity, because we, we never start in the place where we're going to end up. And it's, and it's good to get on the, the path of this, to, to make our lives about giving rather than getting. And you can imagine that flows upstream, uh, goes against the current of, of, of the culture, in which it's mostly about getting or consuming or producing. We're doing a whole other thing. We're learning to make our hearts beat like God's heart does. And generosity ties us to the heart of God. It increases our love 
of neighbor. And we give so that we remind ourselves that this is what life is about and not all of the other things. And so Jesus is pointing out that we can give a lot, but for exactly the wrong reasons and never tap into the true power of generosity to change us from the inside out. And the, os- the opposite is also true. At, at that point, Jesus looks over in the second story that follows is this. He notices uh, one of those widows that we've just heard talked about coming to make her offering to the temple. And we read on. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others, which is technically not true, is it? Until you understand what we're talking about something else. They gave, Jesus said, out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Now, this story is traditionally known as the widow's mite, uh, which is from the King James Version of this story, the mite being the smallest unit of money possible. Uh, And um, so what we're talking about is, Mark says, is actually very little, worth just a couple pennies. It's it's probably one of two options of the kind of coin that was either made out of copper or maybe even bronze that would have been plentiful in the time of Jesus. And um, actually, I have a couple pictures of you for you to show um, this. And um, so this is kind of what we're talking about, just little little pennies. Um, And you can go, if you go to the Holy Land... Uh, you can go and you can buy these things. They will sell you uh, a widow's mite for an uh, authenticated widow's mite for a certain price. We were in a store and that pitch was made of all the other things that you could buy. If you want a widow's mite, because they were so plentiful, they were like everywhere, uh, you go over to this desk and we'll tell you how much it costs. And um, so Pastor and Laura and I were not far from each other as we heard the pitch and we kind of looked at each other and went, mm, I don't I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that kind of goes against the story a little bit. Uh, so for the sermon, we didn't buy any. Uh, for the sermon, I, um, I looked it up. And I think, you know, for an authentic one of these, uh, you can get, um, uh, get one for $200. Seems a little bit like a racket, doesn't it? So we didn't buy one. I've got some pictures off the internet to show you so that you can see what it looked like. Because that's not what the story was about. It really wasn't about that cycle of, of uh, making money uh, and, and all that. Two small coins. What's the point? Well, um, th- there, there's something into, uh, to this in the level of giving the amount of sacrifice. And one, one way of thinking about the widow's might, one way of understanding the story is that it's actually the last story in Mark's gospel in the life and teaching of Jesus before we turn toward the passion. This is the last story. And so it tells us something. Maybe it's foreshadowing. She gave all as a foreshadowing, a precursor of Jesus who gave all. And how that kind of giving, that um, over and above giving of God is transformative. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, we read about Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so that by his poverty we might become rich. And that is the kind of giving we're talking about when we talk about how God gives uh, uh, lavishly and in unexpected ways, in ways that you can't really kind of systematize them and make logical. For example, the widow who gave everything that she had to live on. Do you think Mark is saying that's what we should do? We should, the message should be go tell all the, the widows that they should give all their money away. It doesn't really, doesn't really make sense. And we already know that Mark is... is probably pushing against a system that takes advantage of poor people. He's not trying to make a rule out of this. He's not saying to poor people or rich people, hey, go give everything away and you have nothing to, to, to eat. That's, I don't think that's the message. So it has to be something else. I think, ultimately, it's not about the amount at all. What we've been saying about generosity is mostly about the heart. And so think about this widow and the fact that Jesus notices her. Here's a question. Do you think anybody would have if it weren't for Jesus? Do you think we would be telling this lady's story if, it, if Jesus hadn't also been there to notice her gift? Because there was nothing noticeable about it, which means that she couldn't be giving it 
for any of those other reasons. Whatever was going on in her heart, it wasn't about self-advancement. It wasn't about being flashy. It wasn't about in some way calling attention to herself. It would have been a small, insignificant, and anonymous thing for history. Except for the fact that Jesus calls our attention to her. And that's actually the point. She had to have given from a different place for a different reason, out of something going on in her heart. You know, one of the things that we do from time to time is talk about our giving uh, as the, the church. And um, we do that in a, in a very intentional way, in a way that's never about guilt or shame. And, and honestly, it's never about the church's need to get. We'll do, we do this uh, this time of year, and in the next weeks, we'll be talking about your gifts to the church. But a couple things about that. So just to kind of be clear, and sort of, again, sort of like, is the money in the card? Can we talk about it? If for just a second, let's, let's talk about it. Because generosity, if we're honest, does impact our mission in profound ways. Two, two ways. One, which might be obvious. Obviously, generosity resources our, our, our ministry. It resources the church. It pays the salaries of the staff. It pays my salary. And we couldn't do what, the, what we do the way we do it without the gifts of people. And on the the flip side, we do all that we do because somebody gives, and it's remarkable. I mean, it's pretty amazing. As we come together, we get to decide how to be the body of Christ in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and how to give our lives away, and gifts are a part of that. It's just a whole system of every single thing that happens inside our walls and out. Generosity is a part of that. It resources our mission. But I will go on record to say that that is not actually the most important part of the mix. What's most important is that as we're each on the pathway to becoming more generous generous and the pathway of generosity, that the the transformation that happens in us is the true fulfillment of our mission. Like the, the thing that we offer to the world is ourselves transformed to be more like God. And there's a way in which giving does that, that nothing else does. There's no way to kind of, kind of hide. I mean, it just, it is what it is. The, The money is the money. And, and so then how do we think about stuff in our lives and, and why we're here? It kind of sometimes will c- come back to how we spend our resources and what we're doing with, with those. And, um, and that transformation part is the most important. So we will never talk about generosity at Broadway from the standpoint of the church's need to get. Though there is a need. There always is. And, and, and we have budgets and we have people watching over every penny and stewarding all that. That's important. And we have stuff we want to do. But we'll never talk about generosity from the standpoint of the church's need to get. You're never going to walk in here and say, hey, you know what? The furnace broke this week. And we're going to take up an offering to fix the furnace. It's just not what we're going to do. Sometimes furnaces break. It hasn't been a long time since that's happened. So um, hopefully that doesn't happen. And sometimes at your house, things break and we have to talk about budgets. We do that here. But we'll never talk about generosity from that standpoint. We'll always talk about it from our need to give, from the standpoint of our need to give, because that keeps us in the focus that, that is most important, that we're, this is about our discipleship, that generosity is really about the spiritual formation that happens in us as we begin to understand ourselves as people who give and then ca- get caught up in the cycle of generosity of the kind of God who gives abundantly And then we become part of the blessing that God has through us, that blessing that overflows out of us. So there's a word that we have for this. It comes from two Latin words. I'm going to give you two words as we finish the the sermon and give you some things to think about how to to put this into practice. Um, The first word is a big word. It's called magnanimous. And I bring it up not because it's, uh, we like big words around here, we don't, um, but because it puts two words together that help me understand what we're really talking about when we use the word generosity. So magna, or we might say mega, uh, uber, there's a, like a prefix in most languages that, that takes it to the next level. So it means bigger, great, mega. And then uh, namitas, which is the Latin word for spirit. So what we're going for here is to become a community of big-spirited, big-hearted people. It is the story of the Grinch who, through giving, saw his heart grow all those sizes. That is the process 
That's, that's why we have to talk about this stuff. Because we could go through all of the motions and do all of the right things and do them for the wrong reasons. Or we could all submit to a process and engage joyfully in a process by which our hearts grow and we become like my mamma to the world. So, um, so this week, maybe you can find a way to give in a way that nobody would ever notice. Like back to the widow who gave in, in a way that wasn't flashy because it couldn't be. And I don't know what this is. Maybe it's uh, the giving of your time or just doing something that you would normally do, but do it with a big-hearted uh, engagement, to do it with a big spirit instead. Like, for example, in our house, uh, who takes out the trash? I do it a lot, but I don't do it generously. You know what I mean? Like, we do also, we also do the game where it's like push it down, see how far it can go before somebody else has to take it out. And our children apparently were born without the ability to take out the trash. I don't know, like, what the genetics are there. So it's just me and Jenny. And I love my wife, but I also will begrudgingly take out the trash, not knowing that I could bless her by just sucking it up and doing it. Doing it with a joyful spirit. I don't know. So maybe you just do something that you've, you've been doing and just make that switch. Think, oh, gosh, I could do this in a different way. And nobody's ever going to notice. And guys, um, don't do what I just did. Call your attention to the fact that you took out the trash, right? Hey. Um, so, yeah, do something that won't, won't get you any attention and just remind you that giving can be done in lots of ways. But the other word I want to end with is a much smaller word. Big-spirited big is important. Big-hearted is important. But there's another word that might be just as, uh, as surprising when we use the word generous. And that word is a small one. It is joy. Like Ultimately, when we are talking about generosity, what we are talking about is finally getting on the path to living the life that we were called to live and to find the fullness of life that comes out of it and ultimately to enjoy our lives. Because th that enjoyment does not come in the way that we think it does. And it's not doesn't come in the way that we're sold by everybody around us. It does not come in the way that we expect. Joy is the result of becoming like God who wired us to give, to give our lives away, and to find that that is more, it's not only the better way, but it's the more joyful way of living. So let me close with this story that reminds me, it helps me remember that, and hopefully will help you. So I have this cup. When um, our kids were younger, we did this thing for several years where we would give them some of our money, like each, you know, like here's, here's money for you to spend on people in the family. So there are five of us, so you would get $40, $10 a piece, and you would buy gifts for the, the other people in the family. We got this from, uh, like, I, I know our, our family did this when I was younger, and basically my parents, we, we were five of us, so they'd give us 40 bucks. I think it was $5 a piece at the time because, you know, inflation. So back, back way back then, way back then, uh, we would, they would just, we would all go to Walmart, and we would spend $5 a piece on one another. And uh, we would have these, like, little conversations to the side, like, oh, we're going to pool our money and do this. And one year, we, like, bought, put it all together, and we bought a, an aquarium for the whole family. And, and most years, uh, I would buy $5 worth of Snicker bars for my dad, who loves Snickers. Uh, or we would get together and kind of pool our resources in different ways. So we thought we would do this with our kids. So we gave each of our kids 40 bucks. And so I'm opening Christmas presents, and I open up a Christmas present from my son, Isaac, who's probably like nine at the time, roughly so. Um, uh, and um, I noticed that he's very excited. Like, you know, he could, you could tell. He's excited about my present. So like as a dad, you're like, hope I am too, you know, like I'm going to match his energy. So I open up, and I have this mug. I'm going to tell you there are a few things um, immediately that I'm concerned about. One is I'm very particular about my mugs. You know, like anybody like this, like they kind of have to feel right. It's not something that necessarily other people buy for you. It's a coffee is very important and very personal. So I'm like, I gotta feel right. So I grab the mug. I'm like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm hiding this, right? Like, and the more I'm thinking, the more Isaac's excited. So, um, so then I look at the mug, and it says, you can't see it from here. It says, "My cup overflows with your blessings." which is the sweetest thing in the world, and it's something I probably would have bought for my grandma. 
Like I want a coffee mug with a hunting dog on it or a fish, a trout or something like that. My cup overflows with your blessings. Again, I look at him, he's, he's just so proud of it. And I thought, you know, so I'm starting to make the turn. Like, that means something to him. He, he thinks of blessing and he thinks of dad. So, I, like, it was, it was really sweet. But it wasn't, I could tell there was more. So I looked down and there's something inside the mug. Now, rem- remember we gave the kids how much? $10, right? Inside the mug is $5 bill. He spent $5 on the mug and gave me back $5 of my own money. <laughs> And at this point, when I pulled that out, he just is, he's just laughing out loud. He was so proud of it. He knew, he knew what he was doing. He was nine and he got it. It was so funny. And at that point, I started laughing too. Uh, he, yeah, so I, this helps me remember what we were talking about with generosity, right? Essentially, we're giving God back what he's already given to us. It's God's anyway. We're giving God back his own money or his own time or his own resources, But in the process, there's something added to it, right? Blessing and joy. I will tell you, uh, this mug that I never would have bought for myself, I pulled it out of the cabinet a hundred times at 5.30 in the morning, kind of half awake, before coffee. And it's put a smile on my face every single time. May it be so with us as we join God and his great outpouring of love to the world through the gift of generosity. As our ushers come forward, let's pray together. God, we're grateful for one another and for the call on each of our lives to call us out of one life and into another. And we confess that we do all kinds of things, maybe the right thing even, but sometimes for the wrong reason. Without the the possibility of your spirit working in us and the simplicity of just making the shift to engage this world as people who are here to give rather than to receive. To engage in the process by which joy overtakes our lives as we join you in loving lavishly with every single bit of what we have, with all of who we are. God, would you help us reflect on where we are in that process? Would you help us take steps this week to change our encounters with one another through this mental shift? How can I bring blessing here How can I show the greatness of your love in this situation? How can we interact in a way that's less about self-advancement and image management and more about humbling ourselves for one another and giving our lives away through small acts of service, through things that nobody will ever notice, things that are really just between us and you. God, give us a vision of a community of people who are living that way so that the synergy of this system, the the spark that's inside of each of us would grow into the flame that burns brightly in the darkness. Help us to give our time and our talent and our treasure in a way that reflects your great desire to bless this world through us. And we pray it in Jesus' name.